Now, good morning, everybody, and welcome to humid Washington, very humid. A Royal Air Force pilot in the 1950s, British philosopher Bernard Williams, is credited with saying, man never made any material as resilient as the human spirit. So let's fast forward to today, and I'm, I'm going to update that statement to say no material or technology is, is, is as resilient as the human spirit. So one aspect of resiliency is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulty. It's toughness and quickness of thinking in the face of adversity. So as an old 28-year-old, 28-year airline pilot, I can tell you that resilience is absolutely essential for airline pilots. I can also tell you that no technology or material can currently perform like the most important safety asset on every passenger or cargo airliner, and that is an adequately rested, fully qualified, well-trained pilot and co-pilot. And I do mean two, two pilots in the cockpit. A recent effort in Congress designed to take pilots out of the cockpit raises extremely serious safety concerns. ALPA adamantly opposes the measure, and it should rightly draw the opposition of passengers, cargo shippers, and all who depend on safe air transportation. More on this in a moment, but that word safety, it's really what ALPA is all about. So why? In the early days of commercial flight, working as an airline pilot was, quite honestly, simply dangerous. This was because managements pressured pilots to fly, even in unsafe conditions. And while they were outstanding aviators, more than half, yes, more than half of ALPA's founders died in airline accidents. As a result, schedule with safety became our union's founding principle. Eight decades later, our union's commitment to safety has not changed. Airline pilots must be able to fly the aircraft in a dynamic and constantly changing environment. We interact with air traffic control, communicate with dispatch, keep up to date on current weather, the forecasts, visually scan for other aircraft, monitor the performance of our aircraft engines and systems. While the safety of air transportation means incidents in flight are extremely rare, extremely rare, it's how pilots deal with the unexpected that matters. It makes our system so extraordinarily safe. This contribution becomes especially clear when you consider the number of flights overhead, not only in the United States and Canada, but around the globe. So whether it's smoke in the aircraft, a winter storm, or a passenger medical emergency, the list of possible unpredictable events is nearly infinite. And those of us in the cockpit know that. The human ability, the human ability to evaluate and manage them is central to ensuring the safety of each flight. The advantage provided by two pilots becomes even greater when we experience atypical flight operations. We've learned this many times from United Flight 232 in 1989 with Captain Al Haynes and First Officer William Records, or U.S. Air Flight 1549 known as the Miracle on the Hudson with Captain Chesley Sullenberger or First Officer Jeff Skiles. When incidents occur in flight, pilots are trained to respond. It requires a resilience learned from experience, and there is simply no substitute for time spent at the controls. For this reason, ALPA is a strong advocate, a very strong advocate for first FAA's first officer qualification, experience, and training requirements. The set of FAA regulations that resulted from congressional action in 2010 made certain pilots were better trained and more experienced. It also updated pilot training along with certificate and type rating requirements. So some, while they're calling it the 1,500-hour rule, we know in this room that that's a misnomer because it updated pilot certificates and type rating cards offer far more flexibility for training while improving safety. Since these requirements were changed in 2010, there has not been not a single pilot qualifi qualification-related U.S. passenger fatality. A safe air transportation system has made it possible, has been made possible by captains and first officers who are literally trained for life. And I hope you've seen, I hope you've seen ALPA's Train for Life branding campaign online or maybe when you came into town for this conference at National Airport. You'll see it today in the name of our conference. ALPA, 
It's the largest non-governmental aviation safety organization in the world. Technology is embraced at ALPA, especially when it advances safety. We've been part of development of deploy and the deployment of new tools and procedures in every aspect of air transportation. For example, ALPA was instrumental in developing the basic T that the pilots in the room are all familiar with, as well as flight management systems, heads-up displays, terrain awareness, awareness and warning systems, traffic collision avoidance systems, TCAS, and flight guidance systems, including autopilot, flight directors, and auto throttle systems. In these ways and many other, ALPA's helped employ new technology that has contributed to our industry's, again, extraordinary safety record. Pilots have played a huge role in developing these tools, but they're just that, they're tools. The humans who use them remain an essential part of the safety equation on the flight deck. Why, why? Because te technology today, it just simply can't replicate or report the sensory information, and I'm talking about sounds, smells, vibrations, that the flight crew depends on every day to safely operate a pool of an airplane in real world conditions. And I do mean flight crew, a qualified, well-rested, well-trained captain and first officer. Our conference program today features a panel called Automation Exceptions. As, hope, as I hope I've made clear, ALPA has helped develop and implement automation, but only when it maintains, or better yet, enhances the safety of the system. Two pilots in the cockpit are essential in all flight operations, but especially those that are abnormal or emergency nature. Two sets of senses, two pilots communicating without delay, some with hand gestures, it's just simply indispensable. As we learned with Southwest Flight 1380, two pilots sitting besides each other in the cockpit made the safety difference. To this point, ALPA's executive board recently adopted a resolution making absolutely clear that the FAA reauthorization, reauthorization bill working its way through Congress should not include language call for the research and development of the use of remote operations or computer technology to replace pilots in cargo operation. Two fully qualified, and you're hearing this over and over, I know it, but it's true, two fully qualified, trained and experienced pilots in the cockpit are proven safety assets that passenger and cargo shippers expect and demand and depend on. Regardless of whether a pilot carries passengers or freight, two pilots and one level of safety, one level of safety, protect the lives on board and the communities on the ground. And concerning the specific Section 744 language, calling for this type of research isn't the role of our government. I want to be clear about that. If a business case exists to remove or remotely position a pilot, and I have not seen one, industry not the taxpayers, not us, should be paying for it. The Section 744 attempt to force taxpayers to pay for such research without any benefit to the public, safety or security, is a corporate giveaway, let's be clear. And it doesn't belong in the FAA bill. In the context of today's extraordinary level of safety, ALPA constantly works to, remove, to move the industry to the next level, all the time. As we'll discuss, ensuring that human factors, human factors, is at the forefront of aircraft design, procedures, development, and training is necessary to the continued safety of our industry. While ALPA has, for decades, had a formal technical group focused on human factors and training, ALPA's executive board refreshed and reaffirmed our union's commitment to the discipline with a new policy in 2017. ALPA's new policy formally recommends, formally recommends a human factors approach to the design implementation and training of tools, products, and systems, as well as implementation of security measures and pilot assistance initiatives in all flight operations. We strongly urge the human factor to be included in every aspect of flight operations and training programs. To achieve this, ALPA recommends that airlines use line pilots, representatives experienced in human factors in their flight operations standards and training and their safety departments. We've done this in the past, and we stand ready to offer our assistance. With line pilot experts in place, airlines can fully incorporate human factors into their policies, procedures, and introduction of new technologies 
such as EFBs, electronic flight bags. Our need to fully integrate human factor principles in airline operations is why this conference, is why conferences such as this are so really very important. Together, all of us in this room are helping advance the holistic approach to human factors in training. We're pilots. We're airline representatives. We're researchers, manufacturers of automation, and members of academia. Every person and perspective matters in our effort to elevate the human factors conversation. I want to thank you personally for taking the time to be here today and for the important work you're about to undertake. Resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulty. Pilots don't want to have to use it. But when difficulties arise, our passengers and our cargo shippers count on our having the training and experience to detect, react, and resolve safety and security issues. There is no material or, technolo or technology as resilient as the human spirit. But before we begin today, we have a treat and an honor. We're pleased to have with us the Honorable Robert Zumwalt, Chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. Chairman Zumwalt has been with the NTSB since August 2006, when President George W. Bush appointed him to the board and designated him as Vice Chairman. He was sworn in as the 14th Chairman of the NTSB on August 10, 2017, after being nominated by President Donald Trump. Before joining the NTSB, Chairman Zumwalt was a pilot for 32 years, including 24 years flying for Piedmont Airlines and U.S. Airways. In fact, during his tenure at U.S. Airways, Captain Zumwalt chaired ALPA's Human Factors and Training Group and co-founded the Association's Critical Incident Response Program. Captain Zumwalt is also a recipient of ALPA's 2004 Air Safety Award. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Robert Zumwalt. Chairman, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I'm going to steal a water. Tim, thank you very much. It's uh, wow. It's great to be back in the Alpa pulpit. So, uh, you know, um, Alpa. Uh, gosh, in, in 2000, Alpa hosted a human factor symposium with uh, co-hosted it with Airbus. Chuck, I think you were there. It was in Aspen. It was a great event, and but it was not as good as this event is turning out to be. I congratulate you for your leadership uh, in human factors and training, and especially uh, putting this event together today. So as I was uh, putting together the presentation uh, at 9.15 last night, um, and by the way, that slide there, nothing worse than realizing that your slide is out of date. It's no longer 2017. That's a human factors issue. <laughs> but uh, anyway. Um, you know, as I was putting it together, um, looking for slides, I went back and, uh, to, our, to the thing that we hosted in 2000, and uh, that was the slide there. And I commented uh, then, so this was 18 years ago, I was looking back in 2000 at, my, at the previous 20 years, and I said, gee, the, uh, uh, the airplanes aren't the only things that have changed. And I looked back at this kid that was 24 years old, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't know who that is, but... Uh, and, and then I found this slide here. This was also from the 2000 Symposium. It said, you know, ALPA strongly supports human factors, human-centered design, high-quality training, operational feedback programs such as LOS and ASAP and, and all those things, and a systems approach to accident and incident investigations. And I want to tell you, those are the things that ALPA believed in then. Those are the things that I believe in now. I believed in then, and those are the things that we at the NTSB believe in. And so I'll talk about really a systems approach to accident and incident investigation, but it's, it's amazing how, how, uh, how things have not changed. You know, I've, I've taught human factors out at the University of Southern California. I'm, uh, that was one of my uh, concentrations at Embry-Riddle for my master's, and yet I had a hard time defining it. And I think we all know what human factors is, but rather than trying to define it, I just thought I would list some of the attributes. And the best that I could come up with was human factors is a multidisciplinary science that examines the relationship between humans and the system which, which, with which they interact, including a number of things. And this list could have gone on and on and on. 
when I was teaching at, at, at USC, I would just simply say, because I couldn't remember all those things, I'd say uh, human factors is, the, is the, uh, the physical, physiological, psychological, and psychosocial variables that affects a person's performance. Um, it's much easier than trying to remember all of these things right here. But uh, anyway, uh, at, the, at the NTSB, we have uh, in our Office of Aviation Safety, of course, we do all modes of transportation, but just in our Office of Aviation Safety, we have four very talented uh, human performance investigators, all have PhD. Catherine Wilson is here, Bill Bramble is here, Sathya will be here right before lunch, and so I hope that you'll have the opportunity to, uh, to interact with them. So um, they are our human performance investigators, and then at the NTSB at large, um, we have two medical doctors, and I'm told that we will soon begin recruiting a third MD before too long. Um, you know, there's a number of things that our human performance investigators look at. Um, but I heard something yesterday, I, I lectured out at our training center to a rail class, and I learned that in our rail mode, they don't call it, they no longer call it the human performance division within rail, they call it system safety, because they want to emphasize that, that it's a lot more than just the individual. And so, and I believe that too. I think that the NTSB, it's important that we, that we are examining the entire system. Yes, there is a person at the center of that, but there are other things that, that affect that person's performance. And so I think that it's very important for us to acknowledge the entire system and not just focus just on the errors of the person in the, in the middle of that circle, but to understand what factors may have influenced it. Now, those of you who know me know that I like to pick on things. You know, I like to be the curmudgeon and, and, curmudgeon and really um, poke holes in things. So um, I know this is your great branding campaign and it looks good, but how many people believe that training is the best thing that we can do to improve safety? Well, there's your branding campaign right there, Tim. Look, I, training is very important, but it can't be the only thing that we do. There are a lot of other things that are important to improving safety. And I, I love the fact, I loved and both hated the fact that I had to go to the simulator every six months, but I thought that the training was very, very important. So if you look at the system safety order of precedence, there's four things here. The first thing that you should try to do is eliminate the hazard through engineering or design. Next, if you can't do that, put guards or safety devices on it. If you can't do that, put warning devices in. And finally, the last layer of defense, if you can't engineer out, if you can't guard it, if you can't warn it, the last line of defense is to develop procedures and training. And a good friend of mine, Dan Marino, when he was at ICAO, I remember him saying that training is the, is the shock absorber. So often there's a deficiency in the system and we try to train around that. And that's the wrong approach. We need to have a good design first. And for example, if you wanted to come up with a design to prevent uh, a gear up landing, how many of you flew the Piper Cherokee Ara? Remember it had a system that if you get too slow, um, supposedly the landing gear would, would uh, drop on its own. But then, you know, if, if that didn't happen, then there'd still be a warning horn. And then there was probably still procedures that said, uh, use a checklist or your gumps checklist or whatever, whatever it is. But the design needs to be the first order of precedence. And so um, I came up with these premises, and, and I don't know what the plural for premise is, uh, premi or, or something, but if premises becomes property, I looked that up this morning. So, but I have three premi, three premises. If you, and this is very profound. If you design out the problem, you design out the problem. Now, you know, that's one of those uh, sort of, uh, um, one of those silly things there that, uh, what was the baseball player? Yogi Berra? You know, you think, well, you think about what he says and really they kind of make sense after all. This is sort of a duh statement, but if you think about it, if you design that problem out, you don't have that problem anymore. And I went back in the uh, NTSB library last night about eight o'clock and was rooting around through the archives. And this was the Northwest Orient, uh, uh, December the 1st, 1974. Pilots were flying from Kennedy to, uh, to Buffalo to pick up the 
the Baltimore Colts, if you can remember those days, they never made it because the pilots did not turn on the pitot heat uh, before takeoff. They flew, th flew through icing conditions, pitot probes iced up, they got erroneous airspeed, and, uh, and they crashed. And so, um, so what did Boeing do? They came and added a light to warn you if the pitot heat was not on. But then in their next iteration of airplanes, in the 7576, what did they do? Is there even a switch to turn on the, uh, the uh, pitot heat in the 7576? There's not. They designed that problem out of the system. The pilot can't forget to turn on the pitot heat in the newer generation airplanes because there's not even a switch. Now, this doesn't account for the issue like perhaps Air, Fla Air France 4 447 where the atmospheric conditions exceeded that of the anti-icing capability of the pitot probes, but it does engineer out the possibility that a pilot could forget to turn on the pitot heat. So there's designing out a problem. The next premise, if you design something with enough complexity, don't be surprised if someone can't use it when they need it the most. And um, we investigated uh, uh, American 383 at, at O'Hare. It was a rejected takeoff due to an un uncontained engine failure. And I'm going to show you a video, a couple of videos. In one of them, you'll see passengers evacuating. You'll see one passenger uh, gets completely blown down very abruptly because of jet blast of the left engine. The number one engine was still operating. You'll notice that they, they, uh, the, the rear slide on the left side of the aircraft is blown all around, is completely useless. And why? Because the flight attendants could not communicate with the pilots to say there's, there's a passenger initiated evacuation and the pilots didn't know that until later. So let's watch the video. So you're going to watch this, pi this passenger here in just a minute with a circle around him just get knocked to the ground. Boy, he really wipes out. Now check out this 4L slide. It's completely useless. And why? Because that engine is still operating. Why did the flight attendants not contact the cockpit crew? Well, several reasons, but one is The traditional handset um, on that particular airplane had a simple button that says P-I-L-O-T. Hey, guess what? If you want to call the pilots, press that button. That's pretty simple. But the handset on that aircraft was a little more complicated. So they've got to pull it off the cradle and look at that thing and says, oh my goodness, what is all this? This is literally during the heat of the battle. And then they've, just, then they've got to turn the handset over to see what the phone number is for the cockpit. This is a great design. Some really person, smart person designed this because it allows you to selectively call if you want to call the 4, 4L door. You can dial it if you want to call the such and such galley, you can do that. But in an emergency, in the heat of the battle, how are you going to call the flight crew? It's real easy. You press 3-1. Everybody remembers that, right? <laughs> so we, we did comment on that. The third premise is if you don't account for human error, you yourself have just made a very basic human error. Humans will make errors. So let's acknowledge that and then design a system around it to so that you're not reliant on humans behaving perfectly. This was a, uh, a helicopter, uh, unfortunately a medical uh, helicopter out in uh, Frisco, Colorado. About 30 seconds after takeoff, it comes crashing back to the ground. We'll see a couple of uh, different versions of that in just a moment. It burst into flames. We certainly commented on the crash resistant fire systems but as it relates to human factors, I'll talk about that in just a moment. So another 25 seconds before it crashes. 
It's going to come crashing down in the back upper right hand corner, upper left hand, whatever that is. Up, I don't even know what direction that is. Upper right hand corner of the uh, screen, upper left hand corner. Okay, here it comes. This next video is a lot more visible. It's going to fall. All three occupants of the helicopter survived the impact. The pilot succumbed to his thermal injuries. Flight nurse had uh, burns over 90% of his body. And I met him at the hearing at the board meeting for that. He's had numerous operations. Another one got out basically not too bad. So what, what happened here? On that, on that helicopter, there's a procedure whereby before takeoff, the pilot is supposed to depressurize the tail rotor system and perform some sort of a check. And of course, after you depressurize it, what are you supposed to do? Repressurize it. Now, interestingly, if, if there is a loss of hydraulics, if a hydraulic system fails and you lose hydraulics, there will be an enunciation light in, in the cockpit. However, if you depressurize it for this pre-flight test, there is no enunciation in the cockpit. That's a little bit of an issue right there. The fact that this was the fourth accident of this helicopter type involving the same issue, does that sort of scream at you that there might be a problem? So, the NTSB commented that the design of this helicopter, Airbus helicopters, did not account for the possibility of human error. Did not account for the possibility of human error. That's a flawed assumption, as we saw by four accidents of the same type. And we saw the same sort of thing in the, in, in the breakup of Spaceship uh, Two. I did see that uh, the, they're back in the air, and they on Tuesday they had a very successful flight. They got up to 110,000 feet, basically, and they were very happy with that. But they lost this vehicle, and they were out of service for a few years while they redesigned and retooled, and they lost one of their crew members. And of course, as you know, this is a is a sort of device that gets dropped from from the mothership at 45,000 feet. And the best part is 700 fools, I mean people, have signed, paid $250,000 to ride in this thing. So it drops, they fire a rocket motor, it goes 90 degrees up, about 160,000 feet, they cut the, cut the rocket motor, it glides up to 350,000 feet, and then they glide back and land. So that sounds like a lot of fun, if you like air sickness. <laughs> um, but it didn't work that way on this test flight. This was the fourth powered flight, and uh, it's a pretty complex investigation. I was trying to figure out how to boil this down in a minute and 11 seconds, and I can't do it, so I'll go a minute or two late. But they have these tail feathers uh, that, uh, that can, can move. The tail, the tail can basically pivot like this. During most of the flight, it's going to be in the retracted position, but for the glide and the re for the reentry and glide portion, it's extended. Uh, it's very critical that this thing stay in the right position during the uh, relevant sections of flight. There's an unlock handle that you can unlock the feather. If you unlock it at the wrong time, the air loads on the tail will, ca will cause that feather to come up, and the air loads will tear the vehicle apart. You just simply move that handle back. What we found is that scale composites put a lot of emphasis on making sure that this feather was unlocked at 1.4 Mach. There was a cockpit visual and an oral alerting. There was training and procedures. And if they couldn't get it unlocked, there was a, um, they had to abort the mission because Without the feather, it could not re-enter the atmosphere uh, safely. It would be catastrophic. There was not a lot of concern on un unlocking this thing too early. They relied 
on the pilots to do it right. And here's the design issue. They relied on the pilots to do it right. So um, there's a lot of things going on. It, they, 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 they drop from the, they launch from the vehicle, they fire the rocket motor, the co-pilot's got a lot going on. At 8.0 eight, at Mach, at 0.8 Mach, he makes that call out, he gets a transonic bubble, He's, he has to reposition the stab and call out the stab, stab trim units, and then at 1.4 Mach, he's got to unlock this thing. He's got to do it all just right. There's about 22 seconds or so, I think, between that he's got to do all this. Most, many pilots were getting this late. They were doing it too late, which they were having to be critiqued on. Four flights, four days before this flight, the co-pilot had been, uh, been critiqued on. He waited until 1.5 Mach uh, to unlock it, and he got the warning, the, the oral alerting, the visual alerting. So it was a lot of emphasis on let's get this thing unlocked early. Unfortunately, he chunked all those things together. He unlocked it. The feather came up. The vehicle um, disintegrated. Now, we know that a single point mechanical failure with catastrophic consequences would be unacceptable. That is legally not allowed by the, by the regulations. However, scale composites, there's an error right there. Scale composites fail to consider that a single human error could be catastrophic. So what they've done in the redesign is just like your landing gear handle. Can you pull your landing gear handle up on the ground? Not really, because there's an interlock. There's an interlock there, right? So they've done the same thing now in the redesign to make sure that this this thing cannot be um, unlatched before the proper speed. And so, what did the NTSB find by not considering human error? There again, by not considering human error as a potential cause of the un uncommanded feather extension. Scale composites missed opportunities to identify the design and or operational requirements. And what did we recommend? Develop and issue human factors guidance for, for the, during the design of operation of crewed vehicles. I mean, that, we shouldn't have even had to make a recommendation for that. It's what Tim said earlier. The human design, the, 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 the design has to incorporate human factors from the very beginning. And it didn't. That's one, one of those duh moments. Why did they not do that? Catherine Wilson worked on this, and uh, I know she'd like to talk, uh, uh, talk more about it uh, during the breaks. So I want to thank you. I want to congratulate you on pulling together a great human factors symposium. Uh, I think this is going to be wonderful. I'm planning on spending the whole day here, and I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you.